uh, it's the, it sort of takes that number or that data and flattens it down to a single number. Uh, in this case, maybe like say, uh, maybe a 32-bit number or a 64-bit number, or maybe just a 16-bit number, uh, but it flattens it down and compresses it down. So that's what hashing functions do. A hash table takes advantage of this hash function. Uh, and when you give it a key, it runs that, it when, when it's set up, it, it has a seed and you give it a key and that key is used to generate a hash. And then we take that value of that hash and we do a modulus against the size of this table over here. This table over here is, um, it's um, uh, an array uh, with buckets in it. And um, when we do that modulus, that gives us the index to that array. So uh, this hash function might spit out uh, 65,535. Um, but when we modulus that with 10, we're going to get 5. And so we know that we put something in value in position 5. And so uh, this gives us fast, uh, direct access um, where we can just quickly go to do exactly the thing we want. It gives us uh, constant time access uh, at the cost of that this is uh, sparsely populated. Um, and so that's how hash works. When you go to pull that value back out, um, you just reverse that process. You put in your string, you get the same number again, you modulus it, you get the same number, and then you look up and you pull the value out of the bucket. And so this is how a hash table works. Um, and so we've added Salem, we're gonna add Oregon, um, but sometimes you'll get a collision on the index. The, the, ha the function, the value coming in the hash won't collide, but um, you know, here we've got 65,531, and then we got 64,531. And so those wanna go in the same bucket. And so what we do is we use a linked list here uh, to, uh, create uh, you know, the bucket is holds a linked list and each item in the linked list has the computed hash value not the, not the modulus one but the actual bigger number and the value and so uh, if we go to look for shape we can go in there and say uh, walk it no it's not there walk it okay yeah there it is uh, we, we've matched that hash and so this is how hash tables work there's there's other ways to do them this is a um, this is the simplest uh, most this is the basic one um, and so then we add a bunch more to the hash table, and this is talking about reading it. Uh, and so we read the city out, like I described earlier, and it pulls out Salem. And so um, we we choose these probabilistic or these uh, deterministic data structures because we're making trade-offs between space and time, right? Um, the link, uh, the hash map, or the the, the hash table is uh, very fast because we're just doing hash and we go straight to the array and we pull our value out. And then maybe we got to walk a short linked list. And so uh, they're fairly constant. They're they're for, they're almost O of one, but not quite. Um, but they tend to waste a lot of space because you've got this sparsely populated array. Uh, something like a linked list is uh, very space efficient, but if you want to access a particular element, you've got to traverse the whole linked list. And so we're often making trade-offs between uh, uh, space complexity and time complexity in these uh, probabilistic data structures. But just as often, we're not actually trading off in opposition, we're trading off of each other. So uh, we could be, um, for example, a, uh, an array has unusual space complexity because it's fixed. And so you're, you've got a limited set of operations. So it gives you the time you want and, it, and the space is fixed. Um, the uh, linked list example, they tend to be slow if you want to access the value, but if you want to modify them, if you want to, you know, chop the, you know, um, you know, chop the head off of, of the linked list, that's a actually a fairly fast operation. So they're fast for some things and slow for others. And so you sometimes you're making a trade-off within that uh, the data structure itself, within the time domain or within the space domain. Um, and so these are the trade-offs we make when we choose these data structures. However, there's actually another trade-off that you can make. Uh, you can choose to uh, sacrifice accuracy. Now, deterministic data structures have a 100% accuracy rate. Whenever you give them something, it gives them back to you. They are deterministic. They do what you expect them to do. If I put something in my hash map, I expect to get it out. Um, but there are data structures where you can say, if I am okay with this thing, uh, my data structure giving me a false positive 3% of the time, um, how fast could I make it? How much space could I save? Could I, um, 
you know, be able to access a billion entries in constant time in exchange for uh, a three percent accuracy drop, that might be a good trade-off. Uh, or can I, you know, shove a bunch of stuff into a really, really tiny space, but I, uh, I don't necessarily get, you know, it's it's wrong sometimes. And uh, if you're doing for certain sorts of problems, this is a really reasonable trade-off. And so that's what probabilistic data structures are. They're these structures where you made a sacrifice of, of, ac of accuracy to get greater increases in time and or space complexity. Um, here is an example of how a hash table could end up being a probabilistic data structure. Now, this is a terrible, terrible idea. See, see it says right there, it's probably a bad idea. Um, but if you didn't do the chaining with your hash table, they would not tell you the truth all the time. Uh, so in, in our previous example, we put city in, modulus 10, goes into position one, Salem. Then we go to update uh, the shape. As you recall, may recall, the shape is in the same position. But instead of creating a chain, it now is replace the value. And then when you go to get city, city is no longer in there, it returns disk. Now, this is this is a, a terrible example of probabilistic data structure, but it, it builds on the, the previous example of how a hash table works to show how you could uh, sacrifice that accuracy to save uh, having to traverse a linked list uh, in this example. So um, don't use this one. It's bad. You can tell it's bad because it says, oh, my God, what have I done? Um, so, But that's sort of an idea of what is going on inside of a probabilistic data structure. Uh, I also like to think of them as um, JPEGs, right? If you look at this picture of the Devil's Tower, uh, aside from the fact that this picture means something, uh, if you've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, these uh, blue pixels here in the top left, those uh, probably are the wrong shade of blue. And it doesn't matter. JPEGs uh, have a lossy compression algorithm that when it de uh, decompresses them, it's gets something that's close enough and um, we end up it ends up not mattering um, because it still looks like what it is and, and we don't see the loss and so a little bit of loss um, of data uh, for the performance of having a smaller jpeg is a good trade-off and so this is the trade-off you're making with the probabilistic data structures so this is my incomplete tour of probabilistic data structures. There's a lot of them, a lot of variations of them. Uh, I've got a few that I'm going to just sort of list out here, and, and I've got some that I'm going to dive into detail. Uh, the main thing I, I want to talk about here is uh, that we've got I've got a list here, and uh, the, the main thing I'm going to go into is what they do. So this is membership, cardinality, frequency, rank, and similarity. Um, a lot of these behave like sets, uh, but they have limited capabilities. Um, or are in limited operations, and um, they have inaccuracies. You've got balloon filters and cuckoo filters. Uh, these are both implemented. Uh, that you see the little red dagger there. Uh, that means it's uh, included with Redis Bloom, uh, which is a module that extends uh, Redis. Uh, Hyperlog log uh, measures cardinality, and uh, the double dagger there means that it's actually part of core Redis. Uh, Hyperlog log is cool because uh, it counts things. And uh, it can count a number of unique objects on the order of, of like the number of atoms in the universe sort of thing and only take up 12K. Um, now, it doesn't have a perfect number, but it's close. Um, it, so it can store, it can count a really large number of things. Uh, you've got a count sketch and count min sketch. Um, uh, count min sketch is uh, also included with Redis Bloom. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, uh, count min sketch. We are going to talk about um, bloom filters in depth. We've got here uh, QDigest and TDigest, uh, Heavy Keeper and Guardians. These are all about ranking things, uh, which is a little different from frequency. And I'm going to talk about what these types of things mean in, in a bit. And then we got min hash and the sim hash. And uh, we're going to talk about min hash in detail. Uh, they compare uh, uh, documents for similarity. We're also going to talk about Heavy Keeper, uh, which is uh, uh, also in, uh, in Redis. It's called Top K, uh, but it, it's um, the one that we use to uh, for ranking. And I'm going to have a demo of that at the end. I, I'm also got uh, an implementation of a Bloom filter I wrote in C Sharp. The demo's uh, Python um, because uh, I'm using um, I'm using a natural language toolkit and stuff. And um, 
pandas and stuff like that to work with uh, uh, pro to parse these uh, sightings. But, uh, but it, it's still a fun, cool demo. So uh, I mentioned Redis modules a couple times. There's a whole host of them. Uh, you can go check them out. They extend the capabilities of default Redis. Uh, this one on the far right is Redis Bloom. Uh, it's, it's, it's a filter. Uh, we've got Gears, uh, which is sort of like serverless Python stuff. Uh, we've got a JSON module, time series data, search. Uh, we've got a graph database module, which is really cool. And we've got uh, Redis AI, which I've been looking at uh, actually this week, uh, which will host uh, models for various uh, uh, AI platforms. And so these are all just uh, uh, freely available uh, on uh, GitHub. You can pull down the code, you can compile it, you can add it to your Redis uh, that you're using today. And so they're pretty nifty. Um, and um, so a lot of, uh, two, uh, two of the data structures I'm talking about are actually in Redis Bloom. So that's why I talk about the modules a bit. Uh, so I, I mentioned some of them test membership. Uh, membership, uh, if you think about uh, some of these data structures as sets, a membership answers the question, is this thing in the set or not? Um, which is a fairly basic question. If you've got a set of all the letters of the alphabet and you say, is C in it? then uh, the, it's going to say, yes, C is in the set. If you ask if three is in it, it's going to say, no, three is not in the set of all the letters. And so you're, you're asking, is this set, is this object a member of the set? Uh, and so you, know, you do that in uh, with these data structures, usually they're strings. You've got uh, cardinality, which is how many uh, unique things are in the set. Uh, so the set, the cardinality of the set of the letters of the alphabet is 26, because there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Um, and that's what cardinality is. Just count all the unique things in the set. A hyperlog log does cardinality. A frequency is how many of each thing is in the set. So if I've got uh, a set that's got the entire alphabet in it, but some of the letters are in there more than once, uh, then the frequency is how many each item is in the set. And so if I got A, B, and C, and B is in there three times, and um, C is in there twice, then you get like a little bar, bar chart. Uh, the example I gave earlier of uh, days of the year with the uh, UFO sightings uh, would be an example of frequency. Uh, rank, uh, you can use frequency to do rank because you're counting the individual items, uh, but rank, um, and a lot of the rank algorithms do, but the primary goal here is to find out, is this in the top whatever? Put these things in order. Um, and so the number doesn't matter, the order does. And so you're, you're trying to prioritize the rank. And so you'll accept a, a, a lot of inaccuracy on the count as long as the rank is correct. And so this is what uh, Heavy Keeper and Top K do. And then uh, last but certainly not least, and, and my favorite photo of all of them in my uh, slide deck um, is, uh, Similarity, is this thing like the other thing uh, or other things? Um, and so you could use this, for example, in comparing uh, documents uh, for whether, have we, has this document changed enough to justify web crawling it, right, uh, or not? Or um, uh, is this document similar enough to another document that uh, we think that they might have cheated and uh, committed plagiarism? And so similarity can be used to solve problems like that. The first one we're gonna do is Bloom Filters. Um, and uh, I see some message in chat here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open them up here real quick. Okay, it was just uh, everyone saying bye. That's good. Oh, no, no, I don't wanna leave the meeting. That would be bad. By the way, there, I have all the people back. I feel better. <laughs> so Bloom Filters. Let's take a look at Bloom Filters. Uh, bloom Filters. Um, uh, determine membership. Uh, the problem is, is they uh, sometimes will provide false positives. If you ask a bloom filter, is this in the bloom filter or not? It will say, no, it's definitely not, or probably it is. Uh, they are fixed size when you, you, you create them. And so you create a bloom filter of uh, whatever size is appropriate. Uh, and they're super, super fast. Uh, modifying and, and querying a bloom filter is an O of one operation. So blindingly fast. Um, uh, but the uh, one of the big caveats is, is that you build them for a particular capacity 
you don't want to go over that capacity because if you go over that capacity they start saying everything that exists in the universe is in the set it, it, it'll, it'll say it'll give false positives all the time so let's take a look and see how they work in detail uh, there's two main parts to a bloom filter we've got uh, our hash functions and their seeds and so here I've, I've selected three hash functions you can select as many hash functions as you want um, that's uh, determining the number of hash functions is a feature in the capacity of the bloom filter um, and so you've got it's the same function but different seeds and so like maybe it's a murmur hash and uh, I've, I've, put, I've selected three here because it fits on the screen and then you've got a bit array which is also is of, of a fixed width and this one's 10 because again it fits on the screen um, and it initially of course is all set to zeros so when you go to use a bloom filter you uh, put a string through the hash functions uh, this one is megatron in the bushes a delightful story that's uh, in the uh, data set that i have of a couple of young men who heard us were like pulled off the side on the desert road and heard a sound in the bushes of something that sounded like a megatron the transformer changing his shape you know that that sound um i've just been recorded saying that haven't i uh, <laughs> um but um it's a great story apparently they saw lights in the sky then they chased them down the highway for 60 miles and great uh, but the title says it all megatron in the bushes and so if you take this story and run it through these hash functions uh, you're going to get a number just because that's what hash functions do i've chosen 16-bit uh, numbers here because it's nice and small and fit on the screen again and then we're going to modulus those with the width of the bit array and if you remember how the hash tables work you can guess what's happening next because we're going to take these indexes five zero and six and we're, those are the indexes to the bit array and wherever we get a one wherever we have a number we set it to a one and now we have added megatron in the bushes to the bloom filter if we want to check to see if megatron in the bushes is in the bloom filter we go through the exact same process we get our five our zero and our six back and then we uh, look at all those bits and say are they all set to one if they're all set to one megatron in the bushes is probably in the bloom filter makes sense it's just checking back those values. If they're not all ones, then it's definitely not in the bloom filter. Uh, and when you go to add something, sometimes you'll get a collision. I seen a UFO when I was about 13 years old. This one happened here in Columbus, Ohio, I'm embarrassed to say. And um, uh, it was in the 70s. Uh, so um, I, I wasn't 13 in the 70s. Um, but um, What's going on here is, is we're, we're running that same number through the same hash functions, getting uh, you know a set of numbers, we're modulusing them with 10, and we're getting indexes. But this time, um, two and one are set to zero, so they get turned into one. But six has already been set to one. So we've got a collision. Uh, but that's not a problem, because we've got three hash functions, and they all have, we, we check them all. And so even though, um, you know, uh, Megatron in the bushes will also return a six. It's when you ask, is Megatron in the bushes in the filter, it's going to come back and say yes, and the six is going to be high. And when we ask, I seen a UFO when I was about 13 years old, is that in the filter? It will go out there and check and get all ones. Now, when something's not in the Bloom filter, you're going to get a zero. And that you're guaranteed that no one has ever set that bit before if it's zero. Um, but if something is added to the bloom filter that matches everything perfectly uh, investigators from the bigfoot field researchers organization observed a green blue glowing sphere uh, that matches in, in an overlap between the previous two uh, things that are all set already they're all ones and so the bloom filter state isn't modified uh, and if we go and ask if uh, if this has been in there it's going to say yes it's going to say probably even though we didn't actually add it because adding this didn't modify the state of this bloom filter and so you can see that as you start filling this thing up eventually this bit array just turns into all ones and then as soon as that happens it just says everything's in there and so this is why you can't overfill them um and so this is this is really all there is to a bloom filter um 
is just this bit array and these hash functions. And you want your bit array to be much larger and you want your hash functions to be possibly more numerous depending on, on uh, what you're gonna do. And so um, you might be thinking, I wanna create a bloom filter that holds a thousand items. Um, how would I determine what to do with, you know, uh, how wide should it be? How many hashing functions should I have? Well, there's some math that you can do. And uh, this math is uh, actually more accessible than it looks um, because you can just pick a, um, uh, a uh, number of items you wanna add. You, you know that already. I wanna have a thousand or a million or a billion. Uh, and I know the number of, uh, and I can guess at the number of bits. It's like, okay, I, I want a billion items, or I want a thousand items, and, I, and I'm gonna guess a, a thousand bits wide, or 1,024 bits wide. Okay, do the math, then you determine K, which would be the number of hash functions you have, and then you shove all that into here, and calculate out, and you'll get a false positive rate. If that false positive rate is acceptable, then you've got good numbers. If it's not, then increase or decrease the number of bits accordingly. And so that's how you can compute that. There's also a website uh, that will compute it for you as well. Um, you just Google it and find it very easily. Um, it does the same for this calculation for you. Um, but uh, it's even easier if you just use Redis. <laughs> right. Um, in Redis, you can just say bf.reserve and give it a key name uh, for Redis. And give it an acceptable error rate. I want my error rate to be half of a percent. And I want to store 100 items. And this will set it up and do all the math for you to figure this out. But once you have a bloom filter, they are uh, simplicity to use. You've got the add function and the mad function. Um, uh, BF add adds a shape. Here we add a disk, returns a one. We add light, it returns a one. So we've just added two things to the bloom filter. Uh, here we add light and teardrop, and it returns a zero and a one. And the return, reason it returns a zero for light is because the state of the bloom filter wasn't changed because we had already added it earlier. Uh, and so this is when you're adding things to it. This can be a, this is the clue that uh, if you know you haven't added it before that you're, you've just added a false. So this is going to be a false positive. Um, and so um, that's using them. Um, that asking, this is uh, using them um, to check for existence. You just call BF exists, pass it an item, and it will say yes, it exists or no, it doesn't. And you can call M exists or M exists, M exists. I don't know, maybe that's how you say it. Uh, but it will uh, allow you to do multiples. It's just the very attic version of the same thing. And so um, you might be wondering what you would use a bloom filter for. Well, uh, you could uh, easily, you can shove very large things into a bloom filter. It doesn't have to be uh, keys, it could be entire documents. And so you could say, have I seen this document before? Like as, for a web crawler. Um, I think my favorite use case, the one that's easy to get my head around is, you've got something like a, a large online uh, application where everyone needs usernames. And you've got say, you know millions of users, you're like Facebook. Um, you need to find out if a username's been taken or not when someone's signing up. But you don't want to just do you know, select username from users where username equals Bob and say, sorry, that one's taken. Uh, because uh, with, you know, 100 million rows, that's going to be, well, not terribly performant, right? And so uh, you could use a bloom filter and load all 100 million users into it. And the bloom filter, you can ask it, uh, is the username Bob taken? And it will say no. And if it says no, you can just go create it. You know it's available. And then it says probably, you can just say, nah, we're not gonna let you use that when it's taken. You can just lie and say it's been taken. Because uh, <laughs> it probably has. Uh, and just not allow that username. And so this is a way that you can scale, you know, you can query this very scaled up data. And a lot of these structures are, are like that. They're, you know, when you're operating at ridiculous scales, you need to be able to do things that you couldn't do deterministically. And so that's Bloom Filters. Um, any questions on bloom filters so far? Uh, I, th I think we can actually unmute ourselves. Is that right, uh, Sam? Uh, someone did, so yeah, it clearly works. Uh, <laughs> so if you have a question, unmute yourself. Feel free to ask. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, the, the, the data in the hash table. Okay. Can the data hash table uh, uh, get sorted? You're really breaking up. Um, I, I can't make out your question. I'm hearing about every fifth word. Can you, Terribly sorry. Can the data in the hash table get sorted? Uh, like we 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 order the data in the hash table. Uh, is, is the question about ordering data in the hash table? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have to type your question in because uh, uh, your your bandwidth is low. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then, um, I, I'm actually, I'm going to, if, uh, if there are other questions. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Can you order it, like sort it? Uh, in a hash table, I mean, you can pull all the values out and, and sort it. Uh, balloon filters, uh, you can't, uh, do any ordering at all. The data is actually gone. You can't even get the values you added back from it. You can't ask a balloon filter, Hey, uh, what are all your members? Because it doesn't know they've all been just minified and, and munged down and just scattered into these bits that go into this array and so it's all it's all gone um all you can do is take new data and scatter it and slice it and dice it in the same way and then say is this pattern existing in uh, the the bit array and so uh, a lot uh, and in the case of bloom filters the data's gone there's there's nothing to sort in the case of hash tables um, you can pull it all out and sort it uh, people have implemented those sorts of things um that's that's a thing you can do yeah Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, let's see where we at. Min hash. A uh, min hash is fun. I think min hash is kind of cool. Um, it determines uh, the set similarity between documents. And so when I say set similarity, uh, similarity, similarity, um, my Appalachian roots are showing. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we do the set similarity when we wash things down by the creek. Um, so uh, the set similarity uh, between documents. Uh, it wouldn't have to be documents, but it works well with documents. And uh, so the set similarity is using this thing called a jacquard similarity. Um, and jacquard similarity is, is actually a really easy calculation uh, where you take the intersection of a set and divide it by the union of that set, of those two sets, the intersection of sets, and divide it by the union of those sets. And so the Jacquard similarity of, uh, say, Scalder and Molly's uh, uh, states in which they've seen UFOs, uh, here is uh, you got California, Nevada, Oregon, and Wyoming, um, and then Florida, Kansas, South Carolina, and West Virginia for uh, um, uh, Molly. And then they've both seen them in New Mexico and Ohio. Now, New Mexico, I, I guess that's Area 51, or Roswell, that's Roswell. And Ohio, that'd be uh, Hangar 18. So this sounds legit. Um, and so you just take that, you know, the, the, the cardinality, the count of the number of items there, divide it by the count of the union, and you say you find out these sets are 20% similar. If the sets, the two sets were identical, then the intersection would be 10 and the union would be 10. And so you just 10 divided by 10 is one. And so they'd be 100% the same. And if the sets were uh, completely uh, separated, if they weren't, uh, if there was nothing in common at all, uh, then you'd get a zero. So it's just a percentage of similarity. So it's a very simple calculation. It's a simple calculation with a fancy name. Um, and so you can use this uh, Jacquard similarity to uh, compare documents. But if you were to compare documents this way, uh, if you just like say uh, broke all the documents into their individual words and made a set of all the words for one document and a set of all the words for the other document, the similarity is going to be really high because they're both in English, right? That wouldn't tell you whether the documents are similar or not. That would just tell you that, um, you know, hey, we all use the same words. Um, and so what you can do is you can uh, break the document up into trigrams. And so each document is uh, broken up into shingled trigrams. And so the idea here is, is you pick three words, you take the first three words, and that becomes the first shingle, the first trigram. And then you go over by one word and get the next one. And they're layered like shingles. And you're pulling out all these trigrams. 
And uh, this uh, using trigrams like this is often used in natural language processing as well with machine learning. And so until you get a set of all the shingles in a document. And then you can use the shingles and um, uh, calculate uh, jacquard similarity instead. So here we've got two reports uh, for Scalder and Molly. Uh, and I've just taken the set that we saw on the previous uh, slide and took a few off the top and a few off the bottom. So they're almost the same, but not quite. And so uh, Skinner wants to find out if Scalder and Molly's uh, um, reports are similar or not, uh, or not. Are they telling the same story? And so um, when you run these uh, two sets of strings uh, through this calculation, you end up with a Jacquard similarity of uh, 0.636 because the, the union is seven or the intersection is seven, the union is 11. And so that seems uh, they're about two thirds in agreement, which is about on par for these two. And so Skinner is placated. Uh, but you can guess that this is kind of a slow process, right? You've got you got these documents, you have to turn them into these sets of strings, and then you're comparing, a, doing a bunch of string comparison. This is inefficient. And if these documents are really long, you know, a couple hundred pages, uh, these sets could be pretty big. Um, and so it's kind of okay for the problem we're doing here, but if you're using this to say, have we been to this website and indexed this content yet? Has it changed enough for us to bet, mess with indexing it um, or recrawling it? Um, that's not scalable. <clears throat> and so uh, Minhash solves this problem um, by turning it into a small set of numbers. And so we take Scolder's report here, and we take every single one of these strings here, and we have a, a uh, collection of hash functions like we uh, do uh, did in the previous one. And we can have as many or as few as we want. I've got three here because it's on my screen. Um, and so you take every single entry in this set, run it through the hash function, and then you get a set of hashes. Now this is the full hash. I've got nice short three-digit numbers so that they fit, but these would be you know big 32-bit or 64-bit numbers. And uh, out of that entire set for this first hash, hash function, we take the minimum one, the minimum hashed value, the min hash. And we set that aside. And we do that for each hash function until we get a, a set of numbers equal to the number of hash functions we have. And so this creates a signature for our document uh, of commonly used phrases and uh, pat uh, patterns like that. Um, you know, someone explained to me why this works, and I don't fully understand why it works. I just know how it works. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I know how to do it. It's, it's kind of like how I learned algebra when I was in school. I know how to do it, but I've never done the proof to prove that it works. I just know that uh, this is how you, you know, you decompose polynomials. Um, so uh, when we do the same process to uh, uh, Molly, uh, we get um, two numbers are the same, 233 and 143, and one of them is different. So we do the same process and get a set of three numbers from Molly. And now we've got two sets of numbers, which we can do operations against. And that's a lot faster uh, because there's not as many of them, the sets aren't as large, and we're working with numbers. And here we're seeing a set similarity of uh, 50%. Um, if we had had more hash functions, we might have more granularity. You're looking at 50% and saying, well, the other one was more accurate. Well, it was more precise. It may not have been more accurate, uh, but it, it probably was more accurate. Uh, at 0.636, but um, the reason our uh, our in this particular case uh, our we've only got three hash functions, and so we're not going to get that many numbers for these sets to have intersections. So if we want a larger, you want a more granular answer, we would just increase the number of hash functions. And these little hashes, these little things, can stick around as long as you're using the same seed, which you should be, the seeds. Um, this you can save this as a document signature and keep reusing it and then so you just have to convert the other new documents encounter to this structure and then do that set comparison so um yeah that's how a min hash works does that make sense any questions on that so um yeah yes there's a question
Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, continue on to uh, the final probabilistic data structure, which is uh, top K. Uh, this one's probably the most complicated out of all the ones I've talked about. Uh, and I had to, I didn't, there weren't like nice, great white paper, uh, uh, blog posts describing how these worked. I had to read a white paper uh, written by grad students uh, with math degrees. And so, um, and not being a, uh, a, a author of white papers, nor a grad student, nor having a math degree, it was a very dense read. Um, but I was able to figure out how they worked. And I actually double checked it with one of the guys at Redis. Uh, who built the top K implementation for uh, Redis Bloom. And he compared my crudely written JavaScript implementation, you know, because performance, uh, <laughs> against his uh, C, uh, C implementation. And we, he, he looked at it, he's like, yeah, you did, you did it correctly. So I successfully read a white paper and turned it into code. I, I, uh, achievement unlocked. But anyhow, so uh, top K or a heavy keeper, top K is really a heavy keeper. Top K is a problem. Heavy Keeper is a probabilistic data structure that can help you solve top K, but it's paired up with a min hash, uh, or not a min hash, uh, a min heap. And um, what top K does is it ranks things. It's it's a ranker. And um, top K meaning top K items. Uh, what's K? Well, however many items you want to keep track of. You want you want to create a, a Heavy Keeper to keep the track of the top five most commonly used uh, clickbait uh, headlines uh, that you won't possibly believe except for this one weird trick, uh, then you can use uh, top K for that purpose. Uh, you want to keep track of, uh, oh, let's say hypothetically, uh, the top 10 most commonly used words in UFO sightings, uh, which is what our demo is going to be in a bit. Uh, you can use top K to do that. Uh, and so um, top K keeps track of the those top K items and doesn't worry about counting the rest. And so it ranks those 10 but then it um, sort of stops paying attention to the rest of them. Heavy Keeper doesn't, but Top K does, the Top K implementation, the, the, the way you, the min heap's used. So um, I, I mentioned there's two parts here. You got a min heap and a heavy keeper. Uh, the min heap I'm not going to go into, it's a heap. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm just going to, it's, it's actually the least less interesting aspect of it. And a, a heap is a deterministic data structure. The heavy keeper is probabilistic. And um, the heap is just storing our, in this case, our top five items. And so here you've got um, different words that you would see in a UFO sighting and uh, counts associated with them. And uh, when uh, the heavy keeper is uh, done, you've added something to the heavy keeper, the heavy keeper will give you a count back. And it, and it will ask, is that count bigger than uh, the minimum value on this heap? And if it is, then it will put it on the heap. And if it's not, it will throw it away. And so that's how it uses the, the, the min heap. And then when you ask for the top five items, the top K items, it just gives you the things that are in the heap. So that's how it uses the heap. The heavy keeper itself is, is way more interesting. Um, and uh, here, here's an example of a heavy keeper that's uh, partially populated. Um, you've got this sort of, uh, you've got, here we got our seeds and our hashing functions again, like we always do, right? This pattern is a recurring pattern. Uh, and then here we have something that's kind of like a hash table. Right, we've got an index, uh, zero to whatever number makes sense. Uh, but you've got one of these uh, hash tables for each hash function. And the buckets that we have for our hash function in each of these values contains a uh, the hash value, the number, much like a, a hash table would for the linked list. And it has a count, which is how many items, what the count of that particular hash is. And um, Lots of times there's nulls in here, but this is the structure and you have a number of these arrays, a number of these tables equal to the number of hash functions you've chosen to use. And so when you're setting this up, you can choose to say, I want this thing to be, you know, a thousand items wide and 10 items deep. And you're saying, I want 10 hash functions. I want 10 of these structures and I want them to be a thousand items wide. And so those are the arguments that go into creating these things. Um, when uh, one's newly created, uh, the hash that's in there is null and the count is zero. Not surprising. When you go to add something, or let's add the word object, uh, which is a uh, common uh, type of uh, common shape for UFO sighting. Uh, they just they're objects. 
or actually, actually, sorry, that's a common word in a UFO sighting, it's object. Uh, we go through uh, the hashing functions, we get a hash value out. We module it with the width of these, these arrays, and then we get an index. And then we take that index two, one, and two, and we set the value of the hash. You'll notice the 5062 and the 5062 here match um, in the hash column, and we set the count to one. The count was zero before, there was nothing there. So now there's one there. It's counting, hooray. Uh, it's, count, it's counted at three times, actually. Uh, if we go ahead and add object again, it goes through the same process and says, hey, there's something there already. I found something that my hash matches and there's a number here that's bigger than zero. Um, go ahead and increment that number. So now we're, we, we've counted to two. Like, like I'm this many, right? <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, it's accumulating values. When you go to add a different value, uh, like say, um, oh, sorry, I mentioned here, uh, I, I forgot about this slide. Uh, when you go to query the count out of this this structure, which you can do, uh, you can pass an object and it's gonna go through and look at all the values and it's gonna say two, two, and two. No, the count's two. Um, it will take the biggest one out of all of them and there's a reason for that. Uh, this is called a heavy keeper, which means it's not a light keeper. And so things, these numbers will go down sometimes. And so, um, but it will always return the maximum number of all the ones that it finds. So uh, let's add something different. Let's add light. So we add light and we get uh, these hash numbers here, 6051. 60, and then we get uh, 7312, which is unique. And then we get uh, something that is 1352, uh, but the it's in position two and there's something there already. We've got a collision. Uh, what do we do? Um, these are clearly different hashes, so we can't we can't just put it in there. Can't wipe it out. So so what do we do? Well, uh, there's a probability that there uh, this count will be decayed by one, and so this won't be added in this column in this row here uh, in this current configuration. But there's a probability that it will go down. And that probability is calculated uh, using a, a special decay rate and the count to calculate the probability. And so in our case, we've got a count of two, and uh, we've got this rate of decay, which is a number between one and it's, it's greater than one and about one. So like 1.05 or 1.01 or 1.1 or somewhere in there, right? You, you don't want to do like two or three or four. You want um, a, a small number. But if it's one, it won't work. <laughs> um, and so uh, we do the math on this and discover that the calcul the probability of decay is 90.7%, uh, which is pretty likely. And so um, you can see how, though, this number, as the count goes up, if you had 1,000 items in there, 1.05 to the power of negative 1,000 is a fairly small number. And so these heavy keepers, well, they keep the heavy things and they're heavy if there's the count's really high. And this probability of them being decayed is how they don't decay, how they stick around. They can still be whittled down if there's enough data coming in to overwhelm them. Um, if something much bigger comes in and pushes it out. Um, but this is how they work. Uh, and, and so we, you know, you get a 90.7% chance of being decayed, probably gonna happen. Uh, these, these, we call these things mice flows and elephant flows. And the mice flows are the small things that the counts are low. Lots of times they can't even get into the, the, the heavy keeper because they're running into things that are there already and they're just decaying things maybe a little bit. Um, but if you get enough of them, they become elephants and they can start pushing things around. And, and meanwhile, the elephant flows, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it keeps the big, big stuff and throws out the little stuff. This is, this is that's why they're called a heavy keeper. And so uh, I'm going to say that the night, uh, you know, I, I uh, rolled a hundred sided die, a die 100, and, and to see if I get 90 or less. And I'm going to say I rolled a four. Um, and so we definitely um, are going to decay this. And so the, the one 1352 hash value here doesn't get stored here, but the one that was there before gets decremented. So now it, the number's smaller. And if we go and uh, go to read this, uh, go to read light. Uh, we'll now only find it in two of our three um, arrays. 
but the count's still correct. We've added it once. We find it here and we find it here, but we don't find it down here. But it's one, and so that's accurate. And so these these multiple copies of the data preserve, uh, guard against the, the damage that collisions can cause. And if we go and query uh, the count of uh, object, which now has one of its members decayed, uh, it's still correct too, because we're gonna go look in all the places we looked before, but now we're gonna get two twos and a one. And so we're gonna take the biggest one, which is two, and so it's still gonna be correct. And um, that's how a heavy keeper works. Every single time we uh, add, increment the count of something, a, a thing gets added to the heavy keeper, uh, we shove it on the on the uh, min heap. I, I mentioned this earlier, and uh, things will get pushed out of that as the numbers get bigger. And uh, top K is something that you can use in Redis Bloom, uh, which is by far the easiest way to do this. I did implement one of these in JavaScript, and it was it was a lot of work. Um, to set one of these up, you have to say top K reserve, uh, give it a shape, uh, give it a key name. And then you give it uh, uh, the number. Yeah, you know, I want the top three or the top 50 or the top 10 or whatever. You give it a width, that'd be how wide those arrays are. You give it a depth, that'd be how many hashing functions and arrays you have. Uh, you give it a decay, which is, that's that 1.01 or 1.05 number. Uh, Redis has stored that as a reciprocal, and so they're doing the math slightly differently, but it's effectively the same thing. And so here I've set it to 0.9. And so this sets up a top K structure for you. If you want to use it, you just start adding things. Here we've added disk. Here we've added disk and teardrop using top K.add. Here we've added uh, light disk and teardrop. And so if we're counting here, disk should be here in, three, in here three times, teardrop should be in here twice, and light should be in here once. Uh, if we go to query it, we can say, Um, uh, we, we can query it and it will tell us, is this number, is, is disk in the top K? So top K.query is saying, is it in the top K or not? Yes or no? Uh, disk is. If we asked for, say, uh, we did disk, teardrop, and uh, object, I think. If we did like a cigar, that's going to return zero because it's never seen it before. Um, we can get the count back. Now, the counts aren't super accurate. Uh, they're... Uh, They'll never be larger than the real count, but because they're getting whittled out all the time, uh, the counts do de decay over time. And so uh, the count, this, this really isn't a data structure for counting. You can go ask for it. Its value is that it ranks things. And so if you call top K list, you can get that ranked list, that ordered list of things. And so um, disk, teardrop, and light. Disk was the, the top one, and so it's it's a descending list or an ascending list. Um, and so this is actually number three, number two, number one. But you can go ahead and get that whole list as well. Uh, I think the query feature is kind of neat because it's like, well, I just care if this is in the top K or not. Um, and, and is it or isn't it? So it's like a set in that sense. Only um, the it only can test for membership for things that are in the top, in the top K. So that's top K. I've got a demo where I've used this thing. Uh, but I thought I might, uh, I, I meant to do this earlier, um, stop and look at it. I've got a demo where I use top K to count the most commonly used words in UFO sightings. And I've got some source code in um, in C Sharp for a bloom filter. And so I, I can show both of those. I'm probably running a little long, um, but uh, if you guys are, you want to see them, I'll be happy to show both of them to you. Um, okay. Well, let me uh, bring the code up here. That is That is Python code. That is not... C sharp code. There's C sharp code. Um, let me pull this up to the other screen. There we go. Can you see it? I'm looking up now because my I've been projecting from my monitor, so I'm going to be looking up now. Um, so you can see it's not really that complicated. I created a Bloom filter class. It's got a bit array, uh, which is just an array of booleans. This is not the most efficient way to store this, <laughs> right? If you were really building this, you'd want to do bit shifting right? I had masks and that kind of stuff. And I've got a, 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 a array of functions that contain the hash functions. And uh, when you set this thing up, I've got default sizes of 100, uh, 1024 for the width of the bit and eight hashes. Um, and the constructor just goes ahead and initializes the uh, Boolean array. And I can generate a bunch of random numbers. 
and um, turn those into hash functions, which get sent and shoved into hashes here. So I'm, um, and it's been a, it's been a while since I've written this, so I'm trying to remember the code. I haven't looked at this code in a bit, um, but I'm generating random numbers and then using them as seeds to create this lambda here uh, that calls the hash function for me. So I'm creating a bunch of hash functions that have seeds associated with them. Uh, this is not perfect because in theory, my random numbers could run into, I could run into duplicates. Um, and so I would end up with two hash functions doing the same thing. And so that's not ideal, but it's okay. And so then I've got these hashes. And so then uh, I get the size and the hash counting. But when you go to add things, uh, you to add a string, then you uh, compute the hashes for that string. And then for each of them, you set the bit to true. And that's all Bloom Filter does. Uh, computing the hashes uh, is just a matter of uh, calling compute hash over all our hash functions for that string. So we're just looping over them. So this is actually a very simple implementation. I, I did it in, in 66 lines of code and I got some spaces and extra stuff you kind of don't need. Uh, to check, all you're gonna do is you're gonna compute the hashes again for the string. And if all of them return one, then it's in it's probably in the bloom filter if uh, one of them is false then it's definitely not and so uh, this is a really simple implementation it's it's surprisingly simple um if i were to implement this for real um i mean I, i'd be doing c plus plus because um at the very least i would be doing i'd be doing bit manipulation as opposed to booleans but um uh, that's a Bloom filter. And this is available out on my GitHub and I'll have a link to it at the end. Um, I'm gonna show you next the, um, I'm gonna change the screen I'm sharing on for this one. Um, can I do that? Um, screen, go to main screen here. Okay, can you guys see my main screen now? You should see my, uh, my uh, finder here, uh, April 23rd meeting. Okay, here we go. You, you see my terminal? Excellent. Okay, so I've built a little Python app that does something stupid. <laughs> um, I have a uh, build.py, which uh, goes through uh, Redis and adds um, words from the National UFO Reporting Center's uh, reports. Uh, that that CSV file, I, that, that data file I was telling you about, I have it right here. Excuse me. It's kind of big. You can see that it is, in fact, 112,000 lines long. If I search for Megatron, you see Megatron in the bushes. <laughs> so I, I didn't make it up. This is this is a legit a real story. Um, I, I don't know whether these guys in Welton, Arizona made it up or not, uh, but regardless. Um, so what I do is I um, got my little main function here in Python, which uh, sets up uh, Redis Bloom. I load my data into uh, using uh, pandas uh, with uh, using, using pandas in Python, and then I process it. And so setting up Rebloom here, I just um, get a, a client. I delete these two keys that I'm going to use just so that they're I'm a, it's a fresh start each time, and then I um, I set up uh, two top case structures, one to track words, unique uh, words, the top 10 words in UFO sightings, and one to top, track the top 10 most commonly used shapes. And then I return that. Here I load the data, so we're using pandas to read the CSV file in. Uh, I get rid of everything except the text and shape keys or columns in that data set. And then I make sure they're all strings. In processing the data, I iterate over uh, that data set. I pull out the shape. I pull out the row. Row goes into parse words. Parse words uh, uses word tokenize. And so tokenize is part of the natural language toolkit for uh, Python. And it will take a word and split it up, or uh, text and split it up into its unique tokens. And so it gives you things like um, uh, every A and the, periods, commas, exclamation points, everything, numbers, pulls it all apart, gives you just an array of words. Um, but I don't want all the words. And so I've loaded in the stop words up here from uh, NLTK. 
uh, the English stop words. These are really common words in English, like an a, an, and the, uh, because if we just did the, if we didn't take those out, then the top 10 most commonly used words in UFO settings would be the top 10 most commonly used words in English. And we don't want that. We want to want UFO stuff. So uh, we use this little list comprehension uh, to uh, uh, sort out all the words and sort out anything that's not alphabetic. So if it's alphabetic, uh, then we keep it. If it's like a number, uh, we take it out. That way we don't find, you know, you don't get like I-70 as a common word. Um, once we have all those, that, that gives us our words, we return them, and then we uh, print it out just to show status. And then we call it Redis to add the shape, and then we call Redis in a loop to add the words. And then we do that for every row in the data set, all 112,000 of them. Um, and so that's how this works. Uh, the app is just a little uh, Flask app with Python that provides a simple, I'm gonna say REST API, but it's a, it's a JSON over HTTP API that gives you the shape, the count, the shape name and the counts as objects uh, and the word word name and the count. And then I wrote some JavaScript to put that on a screen. So let's let's run it and see it do its thing. So over here, I've got, oh, nope, cancel, don't wanna do that. There's Redis running. That's Redis CLI. Uh, here I will run uh, the build. And this is gonna go through and start reading that file. And you can see it's going through and very quickly um, adding words um, to Redis. If we go out to Redis CLI, we can see where's my cursor here. There it is. It's hard to see my cursor over the, all, all the noise there. I can look at, I can do like a keys, UFO, star, don't use keys. And we can see UFO shapes and UFO words. And I can do like a top K dot list uh, UFO shapes. And it hands me back the top top K. So I, this is being done in Redis and I can run it again and it's gonna do what it does. Um, and I can do the same thing for words. There's the top 10 words. Um, um, but if I start up my web app, we can see a much better version of this. So I'm bringing this open here. There we go. And so this is just going out periodically and pinging it and, you know, about every second or so and getting the updated count. And, um, what I, what I do for here is I actually get the flat, the little flask app I built. It goes out and it gets the top K list. It, gets the, it calls a list. And then I go out and for each word that's in the list, I get a count. And when that happens, sometimes uh, numbers have fallen off because the heavy keeper's pushing that bump down. So sometimes you'll see the numbers go up and down, uh, but generally they trend up. Um, and so, yeah, here it goes. And this will just keep running until I tell it to stop doing things. Um, so that's pretty much my talk. Uh, let me bring back my... Uh, uh, my slides here and switch to screen two. There we go. And uh, yeah, so here's a bunch of resources. Um, uh, we got uh, the bloom filters by example. This guy did a great blog post on it, made it really clear how they work. Uh, he probably did a better job in his blog post than I did in person. Um, even virtually. Uh, the balloon filter calculator I mentioned before is this uh, little thing that'll do that math for you uh, for determining how wide uh, you need to make your balloon filter and how many hash functions you want to use. Uh, the minhash tutorial uh, explains uh, how minhashes work. This is where I learned how they worked. Uh, here's that white paper that I read uh, that I turned into code, Heavy Keeper, an accurate algorithm for finding top K elephant flows. Sounds like the title of a white paper. Uh, the UFO sightings data set that Timothy Renner put together is at, out at data.world. Um, the National UFO Reporting Center is right here if you want to go there and read some joyous reports. Uh, Redis Bloom, you can read all about Redis Bloom at redisbloom.io. And if you want to uh, look at another use for Top K uh, from a fellow Redis employee, uh, he's actually the guy that looked over my code. Uh, he used uh, Redis to do basically the same sort of statistical word analysis I'm doing on UFO sightings against uh, War and Peace and uh, did some benchmarks and metrics. Found that uh, using 
uh, top K as it compared to a sorted set, it was 99.9% .9 accurate, uh, took up one, one hundredth of the space, and um, that performed better. I don't remember what the performance net networks numbers were, but it, it was it was impressive nonetheless. So, um, so yeah, that's a really good blog post uh, on uh, top K and Redis. Um, that's pretty much all I got. Uh, there is the link to these slides and the code and everything. That's the GitHub repo. So if you go there, you can find these slides and get all these resources uh, if you want to play with them. And there's several, there's implementations of all the probabilistic data structures I talked about tonight, uh, in the ones I talked about in detail, uh, out on this repo. Uh, there's implementations for all three in JavaScript. Uh, Bloomfilter I did in C Sharp. I think uh, Minhash I did in Java as well. So I've, it's a, an assortment of languages. I'm hoping you do implementations in all the languages and then I can just show the code for all meetups. And this talk can be all things to all people. but um, not there yet but um yeah that's pretty much what i got uh, i'm guy royce and uh please give me a follow on twitter and um check out my code on github and thanks um i guess i could take last minute questions now uh, otherwise we're done <laughs> feel free to unmute and uh, ask a guy a question directly or in chat if you like It doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, so well done, Guy. Highly appreciate you taking the time to uh, present.